It's often said that music reflects the time we're in, not only expressing the themes of a time, but what it feels like to be in that time. But there's something else that drives vocal and musical style beyond fashion and beyond social ideals. Technology. Technology has changed the limits that humans faced in their daily lives and as musicians. But how did we get from monks singing Gregorian chants in lofty cathedrals to Billie Eilish's computer-altered hushed tones? In this video, I explore five inventions that changed singing. Before we start, big thanks to Sennheiser for helping me research this. We were lucky enough to get insight from Andy Lillywhite, who is former chief engineer at Sennheiser UK and all-round audio guru. Now, he gave us far more information than we could possibly put in this video, so I have released the full interview as a podcast. I'll put a link down in the description. I also use a lot of Sennheiser products myself, so I've linked in a few of my favourites as well. Okay, let's get into it. For most of history, music has been a transient and temporary art, heard once and then gone, with only our imperfect memories to record and re-listen. We can't 100% know how singing and music was before recorded music, but we do have some clues. Of course, in the imitation of style passed down through the generations in sheet music, although this only applies to certain styles, and architecture. Our voice was limited to and defined by the spaces in which people performed. For example, Gregorian chants styled without vibrato and with long-held notes worked wonderfully in echoey cathedrals where the delay is so long that key changes, wobbly vibrato or too much intricacy would end up sounding like a dissonant fuzzy mess. These chants were passed on through the writing of religious people, who passed the chants from church to church. Outdoor venues and smaller buildings allowed for music with more rhythm to dance to, and more clarity to tell a tale about life. Without the need for the extra resonance required to sing in a large space like a church, people could sing more closely to their speaking voice if they wanted to. And because all these songs were passed on by ear, they were catchy with multiple repeating sections. A sea shanty is a perfect example. Then came the concert halls and the opera houses, designed for more clarity than a cathedral carrying the sound. This allowed for intricate moving phrases, vibrato and subtle nuances, as long as the singer could sing with enough resonance and power to be heard above an orchestra, which is a feat that takes a lot of training. These works were passed on through sheet music, with the help of the printing press. I had to give that invention an honourable mention. That changed in 1877 when Thomas Edison unveiled his phonograph. Now, although Thomas Edison is lauded as the inventor of the phonograph, there were similar devices before, although they weren't as reliable and they were pretty inaudible by modern standards. Initially, Edison predicted his device would be used to make dolls sing, speak or cry, or to record the last dying words of a person. Pretty creepy. And at first, the phonograph had a whole host of uses, from comedy acts to religious sermons to vaudeville singers. After a little bit of time, Edison revised his statement and said, The phonograph will undoubtedly be liberally devoted to music. And he was right. This was the first time that we could record and hear singers around the world that we would never hear otherwise. And this changed something important. For the first time, music began to be marketed, and people wanted to know what they got on their record. Welcome to the birth of genre. Although we had some genres that worked with specific venues before, like opera, generally music was just a music that people sung in a specific area. It didn't really have a name or a category. It wasn't until the phonograph that music was categorised and producers wanted to sell music that fitted into those predictable slots. 
In 1920, the song Crazy Blues by Mamie Smith sold one million copies in six months, promoting producers to take on other singers that sounded similar to her and a host of other people to take on her style. Suddenly, the blues wasn't just a local style within a particular group of people, it was a name and popularized genre. And people started defining themselves by genre. Were they an opera listener or were they a blues listener? Of course, opera was also another early hit. This was really interesting because although a big vibrato is a natural response to the opera style of singing, opera singers would enhance that vibrato to cover up any pitch inconsistencies. Perfection suddenly really mattered because it was recorded. Successful singers no longer were just charismatic performers, but people who could produce a clean take the first time round. The phonograph also changed the time limit of a song. Because of the amount of music you could fit on a record, songs that were stretched out to dance to had to be cut down to a couple of verses and a couple of choruses to fit in that three minute time limit. And this is a time limit that still exists today, even though we don't have that time limit in digital form. The interesting thing is the phonograph was mechanical. It was the power of the voice that literally drove the movement in a pin that etched the vibrations of the sound into wax. There was no nuance or mixing in the recording process and singers would have to run in front of a band to sing their line directly into the horn, then move away quickly to allow it to pick up the band. It could also only pick up frequencies in a particular range, making high sopranos sound thin and shrill, and low baritones and basses a muffled rumble. Frequencies in the middle were a lot more true, which meant there was a rise in popularity in low alto singers like Mamie Smith and tenors like the ever popular Caruso. Because the requirements were so specific for singers having to be highly skilled, powerful, pitch perfect and fit a specific range, more often than not records didn't even feature singers. But that was soon to change with our next invention. Surprisingly, the first microphone seems to be dated to 1876, before the phonograph. But these first microphones were intended to develop the telephone, and were generally carbon microphones. Here is Andy from Sennheiser demonstrating one. As I said, a bit crackly. But there you go, that's, that's a carbon mic from the 1960s, 70s telephone era. Not particularly great for recording music. It wasn't until 1925 when amplifiers were invented that higher quality microphones like the condenser microphone came in. This improved the quality of the sound, it allowed you to sing much more quietly, and it meant that you had the ability to send songs over the radio and reach a wider audience. Suddenly singers became stars and they sung very differently to their predecessors. Artists like Billie Holiday with her intimate, speech-like, nuanced vocals began to emerge. Subtle changes of tone and gentle vibratos were featured which would have previously been lost with the low fidelity of the phonograph. Baritone crooners like Bing Crosby became all the rage, a voice type that couldn't be picked up well before. And as microphones improved, another baritone crooner, Frank Sinatra, started experimenting. Frank Sinatra famously said, my instrument isn't my voice, but my microphone. And he indeed became a master, changing his proximity to the microphone to enhance or reduce harsh consonants or pick up different frequencies in the voice. He used the microphone to choose how he presented his voice and played around with a character that he would never be able to explore otherwise. Into the 60s, industry standard directional microphones like the Sennheiser MD-421 were developed, which allowed for more ambient, unwanted sounds to be lost, resulting in a cleaner sound. This changed singing forever. Singers didn't have to be highly trained in the same way anymore, and it changed listeners' expectations. They didn't want a singer that they could merely hear, they wanted a nuanced emotional connection. 
Multitracking is a way of recording music by separating out each sound in the music. So that could be the voice, the piano, the trumpets, all the harmonies. And it was first developed in the 1940s with the advent of magnetic tape. This allowed for separate recordings to be made on different parts of the tape's surface, which could be put together by playing them all at the same time. However, there wasn't a commercial multi-tracking product until the mid-1950s with the Ampex Cell Sync. Multi-tracking was a massive leap forward in recording. It allowed each track to be recorded cleanly without disruption from other instruments. It allowed sound engineers to put different effects on individual tracks like reverb and delay. And it also gave sound engineers control over the volume of each track. They could mix. If necessary, they could overdub or redo individual tracks without having to do the whole thing again, which allowed for more imperfect performances and shorter rehearsal times. For vocals, it allowed singers to sing over a pre-recorded and mixed track, which is much nicer to sing over, and it even allowed singers to make their own harmonies if they wanted. The Beach Boys were an early adopter, fastidiously recording, mixing and editing each line of their complex arrangements to create that immaculate, iconic sound. The Beatles also used this method, layering instruments and vocals in a way that would be impossible to do live. This was further expanded in the 1970s with bands like Pink Floyd layering sounds and playing around with giving each speaker a different mix. Dark Side of the Moon was recorded in quadraphonic surround sound, where speakers are placed in each corner of a listening space, giving the effect of 360 degree sound. Although this method wasn't a huge hit, unlike the album, it did give rise to home cinema surround sound. With the advent of digital recording techniques into the 90s, producers could record more and more multi-track lines. I think you can record a thousand tracks on Logic these days, making producers as much of an artist as the musicians. Now the singers and the musicians provide the material for producers to perfect and create from is a really different world from the days of the phonograph. This started with a specific type of microphone, the 1930s Lavalier microphone, designed to be hung around the neck like a Lavalier pendant for telephone operators and air controllers. Smaller microphones were adapted throughout the years and although these were designed for lecturers, were quickly adopted and adapted by the musical theatre industry where performers had to sing and dance at the same time. Initially, these were clipped to the performer's lapel, like you see in TV interviews today. When smaller capsules became available, notably the Sennheiser MKE-1, it allowed for a more discreet way of wearing them. Lav mics were clipped into the hair and taped to the performer's forehead, or more recently the performer's cheek, with surgical tape. This revolutionised the musical theatre industry. It meant performers could carry a small transmitter on their belt, which would send the sound signal to a receiver off stage. This meant that performers could move around the stage freely, it eliminated feedback, and because it was placed closer to the mouth, meant that it could pick up quieter singers. Now, dancers could be heard singing, and singers could dance. And this changed the whole style of musical theatre. This brought about the development of more integrated ensemble performances with triple threat performers where people could sing, dance and act rather than specialise in one thing. Without these mics, the wonderfully mixed, fully choreographed, high energy harmony performances in shows like Hairspray wouldn't have come about. But this invention didn't just change musical theatre. It changed live music entirely. Kate Bush was one of the first to use a head mic in her live performances, showcasing her singing and dancing. Later, Madonna adopted the head mic, and Michael Jackson both incorporated the head mic and a handheld wireless mic into his dance routines. This gave the option to change live performance from just showcasing music 
to a grand spectacular with dancing acrobatic stunts. And this could be performed in huge arenas. This changed audiences' expectations. More tickets were sold in these grand spectaculars, which meant it changed what was required of a lot of singers within certain genres, with more emphasis being placed on dancing and putting on that grand show. Handheld wireless microphones allowed performers to cover a huge area and incorporate physical expression into their performances, whilst maintaining control over mic technique. Stages started to boast catwalks into the audience, and artists could now run around the stage without being limited to a small stage area. However, up until now there have been some downsides with wireless microphones. With analog signals, sometimes quality is lost compared to their wired counterparts, and signals can be disrupted, the technology can be quite tricky to use. That's why you often still see wired mics in major performances. Recently though, there has been a major step forward in wireless technology digital wireless microphones. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to Sennheiser because they have been at the forefront of this technology. Something that Sennheiser is really keen to do is to bring this technology to people at home with their home studios in a really accessible way. So with this in mind, they've just released their Evolution Wireless Digital. It brings a professional sound quality with an easy setup to a huge range of people because it's within a really accessible price range. It links to your phone via an app, making everything super easy to set up and fine tune and it's fantastic to see a technology product that won't just revolutionize sound quality for big live performances, but also for the everyday musician in their home studio or when they're streaming. Sennheiser were really keen for me to give the microphone a go before I talked to you guys about it, and I did, and I honestly really, really like it. So go check it out. I put a link down in the description below. All right, so on to our last controversial invention. Just as wireless technology played its part in changing audiences' expectations, another invention was brewing to further that. Autotune. With artists' schedules getting more and more crammed, the music industry hoped to design a technology that would cut down the time it would take to get the perfect take, or at least elevate an almost perfect take to perfect. The first technology of this type came about in 1974, with an audio processor called the H910 Harmonizer by Aventide. Jimmy Page, Frank Zappa, David Bowie and Eddie Van Halen all used the H910 in various capacities, but mainly as an effect on the voice. In the 1990s, Dr. Andy Hildebrand created the software brand Autochin. This was first used with people like Cher taking it to the extreme with the Believe effect. Still, as the technology became more nuanced and subtle, it became a standard in music recording, not just as a time saver, but as a must have for many records. It's so interesting because nowadays we have so much technology and music can be anything we want it to be and we get to decide what we value as listeners. There are some artists out there that shun all technology and completely rely on music as it used to be. There are people that use it to enhance their musical prowess. There are producers who are great artists and sculpt amazing pieces out of sounds we never would have thought of as music beforehand. And there are artists who can put on spectacular shows. These are all talents in different ways. Technology has provided us the freedom in that we as a listener get to decide what good music is and it's completely personal. So what's your preference? What do you value in art? I'd really love to know down in the comments. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please do like and subscribe. Now, big thanks to the patrons. As you can see, these videos have a lot more production, a lot more research in them. And if it wasn't for the patrons, I really wouldn't be able to make these happen. So big thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. <laughs> Do 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 do